Once upon a time in Britannia, a single dad, recovering from a fractured spine and broken heart, took inspiration from a group of kids he was teaching and decided to follow his dreams. So he went back to university to study the one thing he'd always wanted to learn, how to turn the visions he'd had all his life into scripts for films and TV shows. And as he embarked on that eventful journey, as a near 40-year-old on a course full of talented teens, he did so with a mission, to write a single body of work, a well-honed treatment and screenplay, over the course of the following three years. Towards the end of that first semester, he came across a few paragraphs, deep in the annals of ancient Roman history, that sent a shiver down his spine. He found the story he was going to write, or, as they say, the story found him. He unearthed the largely unknown tale of the greatest hero in his country's history, and what little was known about the Celtic tribes who populated these isles around the time of the Roman invasion of 43 AD, around the time of Christ. So he decided to fictionalise the tale of the tribes and the rise of their eventual leader, alongside the clash of civilizations that followed, and he decided to structure that dramatisation into the form of a nine-episode televisual drama which could then be rolled out over multiple seasons. He even considered calling the show Britannia, but when he translated the word for tribes into Latin, he came up with a title that he felt would be far better suited. Tribus. A single word that conveyed so much of what his show would be about. Over the course of the next two and a half years, he wrote hundreds of pages, toiling over each and every creative decision, and alongside the guidance of the respected and working writers in the faculty, he studied the process of writing for television through dissecting hours of interviews featuring his heroes at HBO. Thanks to the university and taking every chance they presented him with both hands, he even got feedback on his pitch from an Oscar-winning producer as well as a master storyteller from Pixar, whose insightful workshops and lectures he gratefully attended. Each element of his treatment and drafts of his script were officially submitted to the university for assessment each scored a strong or high first, and each was given an irrevocable timestamp, irrefutable proof of when his work was written. He was told by numerous professionals and an industry mentor that Tribus was ready to take to the market. Specifically, he was advised to seek a development deal. It was, as his mentor pointed out, an excellent telling of an original story but it was also likely that a producer or broadcaster would want to adapt it in some form. A switch from the non-linear timeline of the narrative to linear would save on production costs. Stronger female leads would appeal to a wider, modern audience. However, he was told that his script for a pilot episode was ready to pitch. The intended title of that first episode was Once Upon a Time in Britannia. Now, only one person was ever given a full copy of that script outside of a university submission. She'd known about the story since just after its conception and had access to the budding writer's work on a number of occasions. She genuinely seemed to be excited by his ideas and thought that his show would get made. She even predicted what channel it would end up on. And as a former television writer at the Sun newspaper, she was somebody who knew what they were talking about. Her brother was, and still is, a well-known television critic at the Mirror, whom she also said the writer could quote about his work. The journalist continually asked to see the script, and offered to help market it to her network of contacts. On several occasions, she specifically mentioned that she was eager to show it to a producer contact of hers. A man behind a string of independent films that the newly graduated scriptwriter truly admired. But immediately after being given that only full copy of the script, her attitude suddenly changed. Two weeks or so later, she deleted the writer from Facebook, which signalled the end of their friendship. She'd suddenly lost all interest in helping him get the project made. Based on some of the things that she had previously written, 
he immediately became concerned. This was, after all, someone who'd worked for News International around the period of the notorious hacking scandal. Based on previous advice of a former industry mentor, the writer decided not to market the script to anybody else. If his story ever did get produced, at least he would know where the leak had come from. Fast forward to around 18 months or so later. A nine episode, multi-season drama about the Celtic tribes of ancient Britain and the Roman invasion was about to launch on Sky Atlantic. Just as the television journalist had predicted, it seemed to have a near identical synopsis to the show the writer had written. The major difference, on the surface at least, was theirs was called Britannia as opposed to Tribus. It was Sky's biggest ever budget drama, their flagship program. But when the writer discovered that Britannia had been created by the same man the journalist had mentioned, along with his ex-brother-in-law, one of Britain's preeminent screenwriters, and his brother, he was naturally highly alarmed. Perhaps it was a coincidence, he thought. Historical dramas, after all, were part of the zeitgeist. Or maybe his general idea had come to the attention of those creators and inspired them in some way, but no doubt the execution of their story would be totally different to his. Either way, as the date of the premiere drew close, he prepared himself to watch their show with interest and trepidation. In a cruel twist of fate, on the day of Britannia's premiere, the writer was in no fit state to watch it. Due to an abhorrent set of circumstances, he and his eldest son were the subject of an altogether different story, one with the most nefarious of causes. They even made national headline news, thanks to the son. But soon after, he was able to watch the rest of season one, and when he did so, he noticed a number of fictitious plot points and characters that were highly similar to ones he'd created in Tribus. He wrote to the journalist, to ask her if she had passed his work on to the producer. In her reply, she blatantly denied ever saying she would. It was at that point that he felt certain that something untoward had to have happened. The writer had discussed with others that she was planning to show his work specifically to that producer when she had first mentioned him. Nobody else had been given a copy of his script or had access to it. Nobody else had offered to help him market his work and nobody else had ever mentioned knowing that man to him in his entire life. A few months passed before the writer finally got to see that first episode of Britannia, the one that he had missed. And when he did so, his worst fears, and in a twisted sense, the greatest of his dreams came true. As each scene passed, it became more and more apparent. He was as certain as could be that what he was watching on screen was an adaptation of his own pilot script and story. From the opening scenes, featuring an eccentric protagonist with wild hair, just as he'd described, who has an encounter with a bird signifying sorrow linked to the Romans, and a threat involving prisoners where one is forced to step forward to be greeted by an elated Roman general, based partly at least on one and the same man. And then, after the titles, when the young heroes are introduced, Cal in his, Kate in theirs, they're around the same age, on the eve of an important Celtic festival where later on, in both festivals, both protagonists go through a rite of passage in a field with other teens who are standing around a barrel, where both walk around intoxicated, having an encounter with a mysterious figure holding a staff, where a number of other similar things happen, where both have an issue with their names, and where both, on the next day, end up deep in the woods, where they have an encounter with an antagonistic character who seemingly wants to take their virginity, only for both to be surprisingly saved by a new friend they've made, a character that's been previously cast out. As you can imagine, the writer was literally astounded. The similarities, completely fictionalised, went on and on. 
There's simply no way they can all be described in this story. But it was when he saw the key inciting incident between the tribes, a wedding ambush set in the borders of tribal lands, in or by a tree circle, where the groom gets slaughtered, and a Gaul kills the priestess and ends up capturing the bride, that he truly believed his work had been substantially plagiarised. Yes, there were differences, as one would expect if someone was rewriting a story in their own words, such as a switch in the timeline and the addition of stronger female leads, just as he had been advised by the university in fact, and just as he had told the journalist. But aside from those things, and some minor differences to names etc, it was clear to him that it was his original story that was being retold, or at least used as the template from which a highly similar adaptation had been made using the words of others. In a state of shock, he made a video detailing the similarities which he forwarded over to his tutor at his old university. The tutor, himself an award-winning screenwriter who'd written for some of the nation's biggest shows, knew the writer's script better than anybody else and is truly an expert in his field. After considering all that he was shown, he wrote to say that he was of the same opinion. The similarities were too many and too specific for them all to be coincidental. His words, supported by the head of creative writing in a subsequent meeting at the university, speak for themselves. So, academically in a sense, he was already being acknowledged as creating the source material from which Britannia originated. According to the UK's biggest TV and movies website, that would make it the 13th most expensively produced drama in television history. An unlucky number. But the alarming chain of events connecting the writer to the producer of the show hadn't yet come to an end. <laughs>